Recently recognized as an Ohio Heritage Fellow, Cincinnati musician Philip Hall is a master drummer who's recorded everything from country and jazz to R&B. Having played on the original tracks for some of America's most iconic hit music, Philip's story has a bit of a twist. A drummer for over 70 years, Philip Paul was the principal session drummer at Cincinnati's King Records, a groundbreaking independent record label that would leave an indelible mark on American music history and would release what are today considered icons of American music. At King, Paul laid the beats for recording sessions that resulted in some of the most influential albums of the early rhythm and blues era, recordings which would later inform new genres of music, rock and roll, soul, and funk. Having started playing drums at age 12, it could be said that music was in his blood. My mother was uh, from Puerto Rico. My father was from uh, St. Croix, Virgin Islands, and uh, they migrated to New York. And uh, that's where I was born. I had a family of all musicians, really. I had an uncle play drums. I became fascinated by the way he did that. And my father noticed this. And uh, he asked me if I, you know, if I was serious about wanting to play. So uh, I told him yes. So he bought me a set of drums, and I got the 10 lessons, and I, I really got into it then. And I, I would say that's when my really serious interest in music began. My father used to play like house parties in New York, so he decided to take me on one of these jobs uh, one night. So that was my first gig, as they called. Many years later, I started uh, working all over New York, and uh, we were playing the Savoy Ballroom in New York, and Tiny Bradshaw was the smaller group. And during one of the breaks, Tiny Bradshaw came over to me and said, I like the way you play. Would you, I'd like for you to join my band. So, uh, you know, I said, yeah, yeah, but, uh, you know, you never expect those things to materialize, but it did. Uh, several months later, he called me and asked me would I come down to Cincinnati and join him at the famous Cotton Club in Cincinnati. So I did that. I didn't know myself what to expect, but I came down to Cincinnati and uh, that's when I joined Tiny Bradshaw. At the time, the music was changing after World War II. The big bands were a thing of the past. One thing about the Tiny Bradshaw group that we can talk about here was it was a small band. It wasn't five saxes and three trumpets and you know a couple of trombones. They usually one each of each horn, and, but they played like big band arrangements. It was one of those things where uh, the group sounded bigger than it was and it was that transitional sound. It wasn't playing swing, it was kind of a harder R&B. And with the addition of Phil Paul and his brushes, it, it started playing some subtler music. Soft was a real good example of that. Well, Tiny Bradshaw was on the contract to King Records as one of their artists. We decided to record a tune by the name of Soft. And uh, he asked, they asked me to play brushes on this, which is a far cry from the sticks Soft was the, the big hit on that recording, and this went all over the country. And as a result of that, uh, we made about three or four albums with my, play, my playing the brushes. Well, that's how I develop a reputation for playing brushes. This launched the beginning of a 12-year career at King Records, where Philip Paul would perform on over 350 sessions and would create beats for such American music icons as The Twist, Fever, and Hideaway. Sid Nathan, he knew what he wanted, but he had a hard way of trying to convey it to the musicians. And we had very good musicians at King Records. I remember one time, <laughs> He came down, when we were doing the twist, he came down to the studio and uh, he didn't like what I was playing. So he grabbed the sticks out of my hand and that's a cardinal sin with me. Please don't touch my instrument, don't touch anything. Anyway, he said, I want you to play something like this. He said, blah, blah, blah. And he went back up in the studio, 
And we said, all right, let's not cut it. And you know what I did? I played the same beat that I was playing before he came down the studio. And that was a, that made that record a hit, the twist, because it's, it's the beat that really propelled that, that tune. Sid Nathan, he was a very bombastic kind of man. But he he uh, he asked me one day. He said, uh, "You know, we'd like for you to become a, a session drummer." So I said, "What is that?" He said, "Well, you record for all of the artists on the contract to King." So I said, "Fine." You know, he said, "Well, one thing I want you to do is uh, I want you to go to the UC Conservative of Cincinnati." and uh, study some more. So it's, it's very valuable because at King Records, I had to play all kinds of music, not only rhythm and blues, I had to play country, I had to play jazz, and uh, I just had to be ready in any event that uh, they called me to perform. An important innovator of American popular music in the second half of the 20th century, King Records founder Sid Nathan was innovative in other ways. King was very innovative in its business practices. They had their own distribution and their own pressing plant. So you could literally walk in in the morning with an idea for a song and walk out that evening with the finished record in your hand. So the King Session musicians, of which Philip was one, had to work very quickly. They had to be ready to do on any given day, they had to be ready for anything. And that was one of the things that being a session musician at King entailed. These guys could play anything, they could play everything, and they could play it at the drop of a hat. I remember he called me one day and he said, uh, we got uh, we want you to record with a, a country artist. And he said, no, you've never done that before, but we just want you to play whatever you feel. And I think it was Cowboy Copus or something like that. Look out now. He came in and, and this country group, the guy had on a cowboy hat and everything. I said, oh, gracious. So uh, he said, uh, I said, what are we going to do? He said, anything you want. So they played and they started playing. And I just picked up we'll a, a brush with the right hand, a stick in the left hand, and start playing the beat. He said, that's great. That's great. Let's cut it. And it worked. And uh, as a result of that, I played on many other country recordings. Moon Mulligan, uh, uh, Midwestern Hayride, and uh, they came to Cincinnati to record, and they, they called me to do all those things. During the war, he had, the, I would say, the staff at King during World War II was probably half black. He had 10 or 12 Japanese Americans working there, which I would think would have been pretty unusual. At King, all the company functions were integrated, all of the departments were integrated. I remember I first came to Cincinnati and uh, I was working in the club with a, a white saxophone player friend of mine, uh, Jimmy McGarry, and we would play a set and come out on the street and go across the street to a coffee shop. They wouldn't serve me, they'd serve him. But it was different at King Records. Uh, Sid Nathan didn't care what color you are. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons for his success. Another reason for King's success was Nathan's eye for spotting artists with popular appeal. And the King's session musicians were the musical architects that helped propel their tunes into hits. A lot of the artists, you have to remember, didn't have too much experience. Some of them did, but some of them didn't. So it was kind of difficult working with a lot of them. One of the last things we did was like uh, Freddie King with Hideaway. He was a wonderful guitar player. We didn't have to worry about doing three, four, five, sometimes 20 takes. He would uh, say, I'm going to record this. I want you to guys listen to this. And he started playing. And uh, we'd start joining in. He said, that sounds good, let's cut it. And we'd cut it. We did Hideaway in about three or four takes. From a 
a storyteller's perspective, Phil Paul is a great story. I mean, it's just uh, growing up in New York, the center of the jazz universe, coming out of uh, uh, the Afro-Caribbean tradition, which, you know, let's face it, is the heart of percussion. Phil says he didn't plan any of it. I don't think he could have planned any of this. You know, Phil is not out there to say, look what a great drummer I am, you know. Phil plays the music, and I think that's the thing that's kept him, uh, that's what a great session drummer does beyond anything you can you know, do. I mean, obviously he's a great player, but the goal is to make great music, and, there can, and that's can be two different things. Down by the seaside, sipped in sand. Despite their monumental contributions, the King session artists labored in relative anonymity, receiving only the basic session fees paid to sidemen during the 50s and 60s. After Philip Paul's 12-year career at King Records, he became a full-time jazz drummer, touring nationally and playing local combos, still performing today and keeping beats in Cincinnati nightclubs. For Paul, it has always been, and still is, all about the music. You got to swing. I think a drummer's responsibility is to make the music uh, exciting, and moving, and uh, I have a philosophy about when I play. I look at the audience, and if I don't see somebody patting their foot or drumming their fingertips on something, it's not happening. And, and I try to, uh, to reach that point every night. If I'm not doing that, I'm not playing very well that night. 